Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back, everybody. So let's talk about uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, we've been discussing vaccines, and there are obviously a lot of similarities in the approaches for biopreparedness with vaccines and therapeutics, but there are some specificities around therapeutics as well. So this first slide just shows us uh, some of the megatrends that are really inf uh, impacting infectious diseases. Actually, despite all of the advances with the vaccines, antibiotics, and antivirals over the last 100 years or so, ID are still, still on the rise. Um, and these are driven by some of these big drivers, population growth, travel, megacities, climate change. None of these really help us in our fight with infectious diseases. Actually, they all tend to exacerbate infectious disease. Uh, we know that with social media, the channels, the public awareness of infectious diseases is a double-edged sword as well, but I think it's more of a positive than a, than a negative. So what are the trends and aspirations here for us, I think, as society and as a pharmaceutical industry? Um, some of the, the, the movements that we see is uh, movements towards, instead of just treating chronic viral infections, we're now trying to cure them. I think the poster child for this and success has been hepatitis C. We've made a major impact on hepatitis C. And now, looking to the future, the industry and, and uh, society, we should be able to cure HBV and HIV also as we go forward. And then we're, of course, tackling uh, more short-term self-limiting infections like uh, influenza, RSV, rhinovirus, which are by no means uh, unharmful with the death toll from respiratory infections being very high. Of course, then there's public health benefits for prevention and treatment of dengue, Ebola, and Zika, which ties into biopreparedness uh, down below. So this question has been resonating a lot all day, and we'll, we'll, we'll hit the bell one more time. <clears throat> what, do we, what do we think we're preparing for? Um, on the left, of course, there are the known pathogens, which may arise, and, and we, I categorize them here into really two groups. Those on the top that are actually naturally occurring outbreaks, so here we've got the usual suspects, and this is not exactly a, a complete cross-match to um, Maripol's uh, WHO list or the CDC list. There are different lists. But the respiratory infections, obviously, influenza, SARS, MERS, uh, the other uh, coronas, the filoviruses, Ebola and Marburg, the flaviviruses, including dengue and Zika, the alphas, like chikungunya, but also not to neglect uh, the potential for um, <clears throat> outbreaks of, probably on a more limited scale, um, bacterial infections like coli, shigella, and salmonella. And then down below, unfortunately, there's the, the element of uh, um, politically correctly termed unnaturally occurring epidemics or deliberate disease outbreaks, i.e. bioterrorism threats, uh, which were obviously a major focus in the US, particularly over 10 years ago. So anthrax, anthrax plague, burkholderia, smallpox, and then, of course, synthetic viruses and engineered pathogens. And then on the right, of course, we tackle the unknowns. And at the risk of sounding like Donald Rumsfeld trying to classify the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, we have to bear in mind that there are over 130 classes of viruses that infect humans. Now, if you could, if you could have told me that you predicted SARS, MERS, e Ebola, and Zika, good for you. But if you can tell me what's happening next three, then that's even better. So we don't know which of these classes of viruses may come back to bite us. And that's because new pathogenic forms arise, they spread naturally to intrinsic variation selection, and also changes in the vectors, uh, as we've seen with, uh, with um, the mosquito-borne vectors. And finally, and hopefully we don't have to deal with this in terms of biopreparedness, but uh, dual-use pathogens, uh, malicious engineered viruses. I think we should have some confidence when you think about therapeutics in our ability to tackle these. Um, this slide shows you a laundry list of the classes of mechanistic inhibitors of launched approved antivirals today. And you can see that there's a considerable array of uh, arsenal of uh, compounds inhibiting viral polymerases, proteases, fusion inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, replication inhibitors, antisense molecules, and then uh, compounds which are going through the cellular mechanism like interferon. So we've done some pretty good things uh, over the last 20, 30 years. We're saving patients' lives. And not to forget also in bacterial infections, we're also able to identify new classes of inhibitors. It's not all doom and gloom with regard to antibiotics. We have been able to bring new classes of drugs forward, for example, in TB. So what types of uh, actual examples of drug discovery approaches would we take to the known viral pathogens? And I think this is, we haven't really talked about this so far when we were talking about vaccines, because per definition with vaccines, one does not intrinsically need to know the disease mechanism to make a good vaccine. You need to know how to make your antigens presented in an antigenic form. But for antivirals, or uh, antipathogen drugs, we actually need to understand what, what is mechanistically the target that's driving the viral life cycle or the viral pathogenesis. So thinking about um, conserved features of the viral life cycle, um, if you think about polymerase inhibitors, there is the chance with nucleoside analogs to potentially target multiple related viruses with the same or similar molecules due to the conservation of the enzymatic replication sites of these polymerases. 
Um, and moreover, there's considerable pharma expertise in this uh, and a good knowledge base on how to develop and, and launch these types of products. Thinking about tar uh, targeting pathogen-specific approaches, which is a very popular approach today, um, you're, you're targeting pathogen-specific features of the viral life cycle, so viral entry, viral fusion with biologics, polymerase inhibition with non-nukes or protease inhibitors that are um, virus-specific. And then the last one, genome targeting. So I've highlighted that because, um, to use John Arna's phrase, if you're thinking about um, uh, just in case, perhaps everything that's in blue might be a case for if you've identified your pathogens, these are things that we might do just in case. For just-in-time approaches, genome targeting, gene silencing, CRISPR-Cas, editing approaches using nucleic acid-based therapies might be the, the better way to go because of the speed of deployment from, um, from start. But that's uh, an, un, it's an unknown drug discovery path. There are no drugs that be, uh, ch uh, approved by that type of mechanism today. So if you think about the, the Chevron, the process, you've all seen this type of slide, how you discover, develop, and launch drugs from left to right. The cost goes up. Uh, I just wanted to pinpoint some IMI precedents for this from the antibiotic space. So on the left, you've got uh, uh, PPPs in IMI, new drugs for bad bugs. Lower left, you've got translocation, which was looking at mechanistic biology. You've got IM, IMI uh, Enable, which is a consortium which is very elegantly trying to sponsor SMEs to bring novel drug discovery candidates forward to the clinic. And then downstream, we've got Combacti, which is clinical trial networks for antibiotic development. And I also propose in green uh, a new concept proposed by Hermann and uh, colleagues, which will maybe integrate uh, both antimicrobial and uh, emerging infectious disease clinical networks. So there's a number of things that we're doing in IMI which give us precedence from the antibiotic space. So what are the barriers to rapid discovery, development, and approval of novel agents today? Um, I think there is still a lack of clarity on when the button is pressed for us to take steps. So when the epidemiology triggers from the public health bodies of the WHO as a clear start sign to PPPs or industry to actually get started. So maybe we need better integration, though I'm, I'm more optimistic after what I heard uh, this morning. The lack of certainty on funding is always there. Lack of certainty on the regulatory approval has, has, still, not been, uh, has still not been dispensed, in, in my view. How to prove efficacy? So do we go for a no profit, no loss, or do we go for a shared risk, shared benefit type of approach? Um, it's obvious that industry works most effectively when we're building from an established R&D toolbox, and that means funding basic R&D research on these pathogens in the academic space, and also enhancing our capability in Europe on the novel technologies, for example, biologics and gene editing. And last but not least, we should also point out the BSL-3 and BSL-4s. These should really be funded by the public purse and public health agencies, um, so that they need to be covered here. Um, and really, the, the bottom line, should real discovery be initiated or just the capability to do real discovery? There are examples of uh, um, um, uh, governmental support in the absence of market pool to support R&D on these types of pathogens. On this slide, I show you some of the examples from the US in the, in the initial response to the bioterrorism threat with Project Bioshield with uh, billions of dollars being put at the disposal of the NIH to give uh, impetus for uh, new measures on anthrax, smallpox, and nuclear agents with some success in that field. And then um, going beyond 2009, as you transition from the Bush to Obama administrations, you saw the broadening out of that funding to tackle natural threats, not just bioterror threats, with successful implications in the, the stockpiling for influenza, and then integrated portfolio approaches for influenza and antibiotics, which several of the companies are collaborating on. More recent initiatives, including CARB-X, um, and of course, since uh, 2014, the, both the IMI initiatives and antibiotics with DRIVE and the EU and the US, uh, Ebola Plus, of course, for um, Ebola. So our examples, we know it's easy to interact with both BARDA and IMI. These user interfaces are important for everybody, that this is relatively simple. Actually, yesterday I went onto the IMI website and I saw that myself for the first time, so I didn't realize it was day one of the new launch. Well done. Um, <clears throat> so what are the potential role of PPPs? The advantages would be a better linkage to that epidemiology triggers, to the initiation of action for vaccines or therapeutic agents. Obviously, the ability to integrate the voice of the citizens and, and help get citizens to actually help us in prioritization, because we were talking a lot about prioritization, but who's going to make that prioritization? Should it be industry? Should it be IMI? Should it be the WHO? We need to get a big church into this. Um, to enhance the funding for EU researchers in infectious disease, I think this is very important for all of us. We see that in Zika, for example, there are European labs that are very active. And to focus on the gaps that are not yet addressed, so that basic pathogen research, um, and enhancing some of those tools and technology platforms. The disadvantage is timing, timing, timing. Obviously, is an issue with IMI. We Ebola Plus showed us how we can do better. Maybe uh, PPPs like IMI are not the ideal instrument in Europe to, to address this, but 
And obviously, um, there's the big risk of committing to the wrong threat and end up working for two or three years on the, on the capability that you never need, the insurance policy, as John Arna talked about earlier. In Janssen, we've been involved very actively in uh, collaborations with um, both uh, uh, US entities, but also in IMI, of course, with, with Ebola. So i just show you some of the activities that we've been working on on filoviruses, on influenza, um, um, on, on, on the uh, Ebola programs, of course. I want to make one point here that this started actually a long time ago. We've been working under contract from the US since 2008, actually before 2008, on developing multivalent filovirus programs. After 2014, we, we moved, we accelerated the monovalent program in collaboration with IMI funding and BARDA funding and Bavaria Nordic to bring forward the monovalent programs. And yet we're still continuing with the multivalents um, today. And all of those, the IMI consortia are listed here. Uh, so I just want to go back and close with some of the lessons learned um, from our perspective about um, these types of collaborations and PPPs. Obviously, long-term engagement is needed and is essential. We are not going to, as an industry, do these things alone. Rapid progress can be made, as exemplified by Ebola. Um, obviously, the funders and the partners need to be aligned, but we do believe that it's probably best to have smaller, more focused consortia. The small, as long, it's okay to have a large consortium as long as everybody's on board and everybody's focused but uh, that is not always the case, especially at the start of some of these plans. The flexibility is needed to adapt the work plans as we go along. Science and drug development changes and we need to respond to the changing threats, so we need to be adaptable. And that, that, is, that is challenging within the, the legal framework. And there is no doubt that the IP is simpler in bilateral arrangements. That is a challenge for, 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 for the PPPs to deal with. I'm looking at Jean, so my time is up. <laughs>